two has entered the podcast. I think it's time to get this thing together. Yeah, let's get it rolling. All right, three, two, one, let's jam. Ta-da, 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 ta-da. Player two has entered the podcast. And we're finna talk about games. And it's gonna be really great. May. May. Minute, minute. Nin it, nin it, nin it, jazz, 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 <laughs> jazz, jazz. Welcome back to Player Two Has Entered the Podcast. I am your co-host, Michael Peterson, aka MC Paper Stacks, and with me as always is my co-host with the co-most. Derek Murkison, aka Full Metal Merc, baby. How was your New Year, sir? It was good, man. Uh, and, and happy New Year to you. Yeah, happy New hey, Year. Shout outs to everybody who I didn't answer a call or text back or text or call. We're still good. I'm just really lazy. Right. You know what I mean? And that's a little antidote I stole from my friend Robert, (laughs) (laughs) who kind of put out the same thing. And I feel you, Robert. I am the same way. I I just, I didn't want to celebrate it all. I didn't want to validate it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I get it. Because I'm the same way. I'm just like, y'all know I love y'all, whoever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you message me, I'll message you back. And if I don't, still, I still love you. (laughs) I tried to. Not many people did reach out, so it's not like I snubbed a lot of people. Uh, but right. like my, my, I saw my sister called, and I was already asleep when she called. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I haven't called her back yet, and I feel bad. So uh, yep. if you're listening, Christina, I'm, I'm going to call you soon. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you do anything to celebrate? Uh, no. Well, what I call a celebration is uh, <laughs> I did some work. I work out of my house, right? Right. And my inventory area is so, so unorganized. Mm. So I decided that January 31st, no, not January 31st, December 31st around 10 p.m. is when I need to start getting my shit together and reorganizing. So I started doing that, tested out some guitars, like Guitar Hill guitars that I have and Mm -hmm. have actually most of them sold already, which is crazy. I sold like five to seven guitars. Mm. It's crazy. But, uh. Yeah, that's how I celebrate it. And then, uh, of course, in the neighborhood we're in, everybody's like popping off guns and fireworks and cannons and it's it's ridiculous. I'm like, okay, we get it. It's a new year. Man, it was quieter than the church on Monday around my my neighborhood this year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, usually like uh, fireworks, possibly guns, different stuff like that. You know, we live in that red state, uh, right. but no, no it, 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 there wasn't a whole lot popping off around here. So, yeah. And I, I'm going to say this for the people that do shoot their guns off. Guys, those bullets do have to come down. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, think about that when you're shooting it up. Yeah. So, well, I'm glad to hear that you didn't wait to until the new year to start your resolutions. Nope. You did it while still in 2020. I mean, two hours left of 2020, but you did it. And that yeah, counts. I sure did. So, did, were you ever really into rock band? I used to have a lot of rock band parties. I loved it. When I was in high school, I, when Guitar Hero 3 came out, mm-hmm. me and my cousins, we had the whole set and we would just go for it. Mm-hmm. It was really fun. Through the fire and the flames, forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. But yeah, we were, we were pretty into it. But I fell off after that. I've seen a buddy actually be able to play that Through the Fire and Flames, I think either on Hard or Expert. He strummed with his elbow, and then he picked the buttons with both of his hands. Oh, wow. That's how he was able to do it. I was like, oh, that's smart. Because <laughs> really, most of them are hammer-ons. And for those who don't play Guitar Hero or Rock Band, a hammer-on is when you just have to strum for the first note, but the rest, because they're so close together, as long as you press the button in sequence, the note will still play. Oh. So he would hammer on with his elbow and just tap, 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 hammer on, tap, 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 tap. I was like, bro, that's genius. I mean, I did hammer-ons too. I think if you... Play any kind of difficult song at hard or above. You need to learn that technique, uh, which I don't know if it was in the original Guitar Hero or Guitar Hero 2, but I first started using it when because I, I played it since the beginning, obviously, but I started using it when Rock Band came out mm-hmm. because they made a bigger deal about hammer ons, especially with some of the design of their songs. Right. I was definitely I was team Rock Band when Harmonix and Red Octane split. I, I was team Harmonix. Oh, OK. Yeah, that. But I still got some rock bands too. It's just I I preferred. Or, or, I mean, Guitar Heroes too. I just preferred rock bands. So. Okay. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Well, this week I finished Sweet Home, and I don't want to linger on it. But sweet Chariot. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> <Not this way. laughs> sweet glow. Home. Sweet, sweet home, home. Sweet Chariot. No, it's it's Sweet Home Swing Chariot. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
but I, I won't linger on it too much because I know you haven't had a chance to finish it. Suffice it to say that I thought they stuck the landing on the first season. Yay. And the last couple episodes were super emotional. Okay. Like, I was openly weeping in episode 10. I was like, <laughs> I was sadder than sad boy. Oh, yeah. So. I'm excited to hear what you have to think. Maybe we'll do some spoiler talk next week. Now that I'm time stamping episodes, it's easier than ever to just talk spoilers. Woo! Yay, I'm making an effort. So <laughs> I also saw Wonder Woman 1984 on the HBO Max. Is that what's called? HBO, HBO Max? Max. HBO Max. To the max. Yeah. So have you seen it? Do you plan on seeing it? Uh, I did plan on seeing it because I thought I had HBO Max, but apparently I don't. So. Mm. I just mm-hmm. gave up. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to save you some time. You don't need to see it. No. It's not good. I, I know. I'm very disappointed that it's not good. Trust me. I really, 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 really wanted to like this film. It starts off really promising. The opening, and this isn't like spoilers or anything. The opening shoots back to, you know, Diana when she was a child. And they're doing like this Olympic style kind of competition where they have to like race each other to the end and they have to like shoot arrows with like a particular vial of smoke so you can see who's ahead you know throughout the island and they're horseback riding and swimming and whatever whatever they show diana somewhere you know where she's not the little girl before she started training but she's not quite you know a teenager yet right which is odd because her mother's watching and like yeah you go when i was (laughs) like i'm pretty sure her mother found out she was training when she was much older and she was pissed about it but whatever we'll let that go yeah and she kind of cheats. She takes a shortcut to try to get to the end because she falls off her horse and she realizes she can still get ahead of the other warriors if she slides down on a shortcut. But right before she's about to cross the finish line, a princess bride, I can't remember her at the actress's name, but you know, the, the tough chick, her aunt that yeah. trained her just yokes her up like, nah, you ain't about to cheat. <laughs> right. And you think that that lesson will come up later in the movie. It doesn't. <laughs> and then when the movie starts proper, that's when the problems really settle in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Without ruining too much, let me say let me say one more good thing about the film. I want to try to be as positive as I can. Chris Pine is in it. I'm not going to explain how he comes into it because those who watched the original movie know that you know it would be very difficult for him to show up in a sequel. Right. But he does show up through machinations of the plot, and the chemistry between him and Gal Gadot is still really good. And he's really affable as kind of a man out of time trying to get used to the 80s. You know, that's a tough right. thing to do. Sometimes fish out of water stories can be annoying, but. Uh, Kristen mentioned it recently when we were talking about the film. She liked how the fish out of water was reversed instead of instead of Gal, it was Chris. Right. And they were kind of guiding each other, you know, through. That's about the only good thing I can say about the movie. Everything else is just if I had to sum it up in one word, I would say lazy. Yeah. Between the plot device to get Kristen Wiig's character to be a villain, it's the same plot you've seen with like Batman Forever and the Riddler, or most recently mm-hmm. Amazing Spider Man Two and Electro. Oh. Nerdy person with glasses, takes glasses off, no longer nerdy, gets powers. Right. It's stupid. I'm not sure if it was coronavirus that messed this up. Maybe they had more ambitious stuff and they just kind of had to wrap it up. I don't know when they actually finished filming. There's just... Uh, again, I don't I don't want to like spoil it, I guess, for people who haven't seen the film. There's just too many plot threads that don't make sense. Mm-hmm. you know. And they, they use this very cliche kind of monkey's paw type style situation where there's like wishing going on and and a god is supposed to be behind it and they have this big lore dump about a god that's supposed to be behind it but the god never shows up and and the climactic battle at the end is like lame and poorly shot and poorly choreographed there's more wire work in this movie than a shaw bros film i was like is this wonder woman or crouching tiger (laughs) (laughs) but it just it's sloppy and it doesn't look good and it's really badly paced like about i think halfway into the second act i was looking at Kristen like this is kind of boring like when's this gonna pick up and then it has a good action scene and it goes right back to being boring again yeah, that sucks. and wonder woman herself like in her outfit and everything is hardly in it mm. i'm extremely disappointed by it i don't think it diminishes the original film at all i think wonder woman you know og wonder woman is really probably good. one of the best if not the only good dc movie in the dc current dc universe I would throw Shazam in there. Yeah, Shazam was pretty dope. And then I would ironically throw in Aquaman because it's just it's a stupid it's movie, but it's, it's a so fun, fun watch. Yeah. yeah, it's a fun watch. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with this film as far as it being a family film. Like I think kids will enjoy it. My son did. He's four. He just likes watching the action, and obviously the the plot's very simple. 
But uh, as far as like a discerning comic book fan, as somebody who like the bar is raised because of all the good films you've already seen so far, it it does not hold up, not at all. Mm, wow. So oh, that sucks. <sighs> but let's talk about some happier things, like hey. video games. What video hey. games have you been playing this week, Derek? I've been playing. Well, first of all, I beat Tokyo Xanadu EX Plus, Ooh. and I beat it, beat it. So Ooh, uh, beat it, beat the credit it. the credits rolled earlier this week, and then it hit me with the generic rpg thing where it's like hey you beat the game but you didn't beat the game so Mm -hmm. why don't you go back load your save file and then you can beat the game Mm -hmm. so you literally have to reload your save file twice to get to the complete complete ending interesting and uh so it's not it's not a decision mm -hmm. you missed you literally have to beat it and then load and try again and then it it recognizes that yeah interesting yeah so uh trails of cold steel 4 did the same thing Mm -hmm. i liked it I really enjoyed it. Kind of hit my trails fix a little bit, although not as well as I would have wanted. But the mm. combat was fun, addictive. The uh, gameplay loop was really good. And the story actually ended up being really emotional. I was quite surprised. So Interesting. Yeah, that was Tokyo's Xanadu, man. And right now on the PlayStation Store holiday sale, it is only 12 bucks. Worth it. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, if you're interested in JRPGs, pick that up. A couple of other things that I tried this week, Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth Hacker's Memory. I played the original Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth back in, I want to say 2016. I put about 70 hours into it, beat the beat the game, got wow. all the Digimon and stuff. Yeah, when I looked, <laughs> when it said I want, it wanted to transfer the save data, and it said 68 hours, I was like, I played that game for that long? Jesus. What did you but, originally play it on? <clears throat> uh, PS4. Okay, and what what's it on now? Uh, it's not on PS4. So, what is this like a remake or a? a oh no, no! This is a uh, sequel kind of side story game. Oh, okay, like yeah. a like a, like a Miles Morales, right? Basically, gotcha. And uh, yeah, I booted that up, and I don't know. I is hmm, the original one. It took me a while to get into because mm-hmm. you know it was regular turn based combat, and some of the moves weren't really flashy. It was just show the Digimon getting hit mm-hmm. and reacting to the hit, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like any special flashy moves. I might continue with it and see where it goes, because mm-hmm. I really, really love Digimon. I love Digimon more than Pokemon. Digimon is, like, one of my favorite things from my childhood, so I really want to give it another shot. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And another thing that I always try to get into, but I never can, strategy RPG games. Mm-hmm. I picked up this guy 01 Complete on PS4. It was on sale recently, too, right? I'm not aware. I, I feel like I saw it on sale on Switch, but maybe I'm wrong. How, how much did you pick it up for? Uh, like five bucks. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. It's never <laughs> that much on sale on, right. on Switch, but yeah, yeah okay. I mean, it just kind of just came out. Yeah, what'd you think? I enjoy the sprite work. I enjoy the dialogue. It's just the gameplay, mm-hmm. the moving around the characters, and it's just funny because I should like it. I should love it. Yeah, but I just I don't like the moving the characters around the board to make them do things type gameplay. It's just it's too involved. Yeah. For me. You know, there are some strategy RPGs where that doesn't stand out as much. I mean, if you think about it, it's kind of like any other RPG because you, you know, especially an action RPG, RPG, you position your character and then you execute attacks. Right. But I, I get what you mean. It's way slowed down because you actually have to travel a distance and on a badly designed map or a game that doesn't consider the extra time it takes to position characters, it can seem... You know, like you said, a little bit more boring or or slowed down. Yeah, that's the number one reason why I can't get into Fire Emblem. Mm. He, did, have you ever tried Three Houses? Yeah, I tried the. Uh, I did it the first tutorial battle, and mm-hmm. I just I just couldn't. I couldn't, and I know that it's good. Yeah. I know it's good, but uh, it's just it's one of those things. Yeah, I mean, strategy RPGs might not be for you. I think I had mentioned before that you should try Vandal Hearts because it's like mm-hmm. the most basic form of that game that i've played that is also very competent and good right you know what i mean like which which is rare to find a game that's so welcoming to newcomers but also really solid yeah i mean i would say fire emblem three houses is also very welcoming as well plus it breaks up that gameplay with the persona-esque school days aesthetic you know and all the relationship stuff so I'd say if you can't get into three houses, it's a pretty decent representation of the genre. Yeah, it might not be might not be for you, man. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Right. But I don't like this guy either for reasons I've already explained on this show. I, I agree with you. The sprite work is fantastic. The dialogue is a little tongue in cheek, but it's pretty good, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
And I, I like some of the fourth wall breaks. I like calling somebody a mid boss as an insult and I'm getting upset. Right. Like, I'm a full on boss. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. To me, Disguy is an example of just throw everything into the pot. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it's a little too much. Like, I, I don't mind for those types of games to get complex. But there's just, it overwhelms my brain to know that every item has its own dungeon that you can do over 100 levels in to, to power it up. And they throw characters at you, especially on the complete edition, like crazy. And right. I just, I can't handle it. It's too much stuff all at once. I would rather like just a couple of things to focus on. I'm sure it has its fans. I just, I just can't. What I can do is Donut County. I grabbed it on the PlayStation Store. It was $3.66. 60 cents or so wow and it is amazing so vicky actually bought it earlier in the week for her switch and she played it she's like oh my god don't i care i love it and Mm -hmm. i played i played a little bit of it and i was like okay i can get down with this yeah so i bought it myself and i played it for about an hour and a half last night Uh and it is so funny yeah it's so funny the dialogue is so impressive i think it was made by one dude yeah, I, I believe it was. I know you're talking about that. The raccoon is probably my favorite character. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. BT. Hilarious. He's, he, BT. Yeah. He's good. <laughs> yeah, the dialogue's great. The gameplay is just real simple. And some some of the puzzles make you think a bit. But, well, if you've never played it or heard of it, basically it's a game where you control this hole that opens up in the ground and you just eat up everything. Mm-hmm. And eventually the hole gets bigger and bigger with everything that you eat. And eventually you're like swallowing houses and buildings and everything is kind of katamari ish in that aspect where it's just, oh yeah you're kind of collecting things mm. but yeah it's it's really fun it's a real good time uh if you guys go to the playstation store pick it up i think it's on sale until the 20th yeah so, it's completely yeah. worth it i agree and it's it's short so it's a game you can feel good about finishing i think you can finish it in like five or six hours if you play lackadaisically possibly quicker if you're trying to do like a little speed run Mm-hmm. And those puzzle aspects, I think, help stand it apart. That and that, like you said, the dialogue. And it, it does feel like a reverse Katamari. Just to give you an example of one of the puzzles that I thought was particularly funny. Sometimes the stuff that you can naturally pick up in the environment isn't enough to make your hole big enough to proceed. Mm-hmm. So you have to increase the size of your hole in creative ways. That's like getting a girl, a girl bunny and a guy bunny into your hole so they multiply and shoot out a bunch of baby bunnies that you can yeah, catch. Yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious yeah no that's good times or cooking popcorn and the kernels themselves yeah. pop out and then you mm-hmm. catch them yeah so th- there are a lot of really cool interesting ways to make the hole bigger and then you get kind of an expanded story about why it's happening and what's going on and you know that's actually the first video game that benjamin has ever beaten really he was able to do it by d- uh, using the touch screen on the switch since oh, he, okay. he's not dexterous enough to use the controllers right even now he kind of struggles with it, but especially when he was, I think he was like two or three when he beat that game. Oh, cool. And he only needed me for, I think the boss fight at the very, very end. And you'll see what I'm talking about when you get there. And then some gentle guidance on some of the puzzles. I didn't do it for him, but he was kind of like, I don't know how to do this. And I was like, well, look at this thing, you know, he he, he did it pretty much by himself. I was very proud. All right. Well, what are you playing? Oh boy, let me cut through them real fast because most of it's the same. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. I unlocked King Rome and Master Koga. Okay. And I think I'm really close to being done with the game. Oh. Uh, Teba is turning out to be my favorite character. He's the Rito from the original game that you partner up with to take down the flying divine beast. He's just really good. He has this move that you can hold down while you're using other moves to attack. And when you release it, fully charged. It fires out like 15 bomb arrows, and then bomb mm. arrows just rain from the sky for a period of seconds. It's amazing. Cool. Cyberpunk, still kind of grinding through that. I've really halted on playing that casually because I've gotten bored with it, but I'm oh. still playing. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm going to finish it on the stream because I've committed to it. It's still crashing even after the most recent update, 22 times so far. However, wow. the most recent episode I recorded, which was on Tuesday because I took New Year's Eve and New Year's Day off, it didn't crash the entire episode. And that's the first episode of that series that I've streamed where I didn't crash. And that's on PS5 it crashed 22 times? Yes. Wow. Having it on a next-gen system does take care of some of the problems. And people are lying when they say the PC version is immaculate. Because I've seen plenty of people have problems with the PC. But obviously with the PC, 
the problems are even further reduced, especially depending on your setup. Mm -hmm. But with the PS5, I still have plenty of bugs and weird shit going on, and it it crashes on the regular. So wow. it is what it is. But mm -hmm. Final Fantasy X, still cutting through that. Love that game. Love it so much. Final Fantasy X? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. sorry, let me interrupt you. Yeah. I forgot. I uh, Vicky agreed to watch me play Final Fantasy X because she can't play through it herself. Like, she can't bring herself to do it. She tried it. She uh -huh. said it's not for her. Like I said, it's like one of my favorite games. So, yeah. uh, she sat down and we played through, like, up until the Say Temple. Okay. Yuna gets her first uh, summon. Right. And she was just talking so much shit throughout it. <laughs> and I was just like, fuck you, babe. Wait, wait till you get, wait till you get to the end of Luca. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was good times though, cause we were making fun of it too. Cause I mean, oh, yeah, of course. it's a great game, but there's also some really, really bad stuff in there, which is, it's fine. Yeah. I love it. But, uh, what was some of the stuff that she was criticizing? Oh boy, let's see. Well, obviously some of the dialogue. Uh huh. Uh, she really liked Waka. When he showed up, I said, yeah, he's cool. Too bad he's a racist. <laughs> oh, he is. Al yeah. Al -bed. Um, yeah. Fucking Al Bed. What's wrong with you? Hey, but he's got an arc. He learns. He does. He, he does. To... He does. He tells Riku she's one of the good ones. <laughs> you're one of the good ones, girl. You, you're so well spoken for an Al Bed, yeah? Right. You're one of the good ones, yeah? And Riku's like, thanks. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> oh, Waka. I told her, uh, he's got the something, there's something about Mary hair going on. Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah. And she has never seen it. And she didn't even know what I was referring to. So I was like, oh, well, basically. Mary uses some of Ben Stiller's hoo-ha juice and uses it on her hair and it sticks That's up just like deal. Waka's. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's great. Yeah. I think I mentioned this last week. When you're exercising, man, a comfortable game. Like, I'm just, I get lost in it. I, you know, because a lot of the grindy stuff of that game that I used to like, I used to hate because it would grind down gameplay, but it also felt necessary. Like, mm -hmm. playing a ton of Blitzball. Yeah. I'm in, I'm on the treadmill just walking away, playing some Blitzball, having the time of my life. So yeah. <laughs> I recommend it. Find yourself a game that just makes you feel good inside, like Mom's Oatmeal, and play that right. while you exercise. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Playing some more Smash Brothers just for funsies. I really like the mode, and I've been slowly, slowly going through it, where you can go to your collection of spirits and re-challenge spirit battles for a high score. Mm-hmm. And you automatically get a perfect score if you beat a spirit battle without equipping any spirits yourself. Oh, okay. So I've been working on that. I can pretty much do all of the novice and like level like one and two and three star battles. Three stars get a little hairy. Yeah. The legendary battles, I don't think I've done a single one without equipping spirits because they're just so unbelievably powerful. Right. And some of the some of the mechanics are just set up to be cheaty, but. <laughs> That's something I've been slowly working on and also using it to experiment with different characters. Like one day, I like this week, I decided to try to challenge all of the Metal Gear Solid spirits with Snake. And that was fun. Cool. So, yeah. And the only other game that I played is actually a new game that I tried. And I've been playing it casually and having a really good time with it so far. I bought it on sale for 20 bucks. World of Final Fantasy Maxima. Mm. So I... Kind of hated this game, the first hour of it. Yeah. The story is one of those weak stories. I mean... It's, the story's it's, pretty throwaway. I was... It's throwaway, but only that. It's it's needlessly complicated. I took a screenshot when I went to the room with the girl who drinks tea who forgot her name. Because uh -huh. I was like, this is the most Kingdom Hearts-ass screen I've ever seen in my yeah. life. <laughs> it reminds me a lot of Kingdom Hearts, but like in the not fun nonsense way. Right. But once you get into the actual gameplay and you go to the different worlds themed after Final Fantasy and you start, like, kind of collecting the monsters, you collect the monsters like you would collect Pokemon. Yeah, yeah. And they even, they don't have just the catch condition of whittling down their HP. Sometimes the catch condition or the ability to make them catchable is healing them. Yeah. Or hitting them with a certain element or giving them a certain status effect, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of learn that. Then you learn, you can stack the characters on your character up to three. There's like a large, medium, and small within the mm -hmm. stack, and all the different characters have different sizes. And some of the stacks are strong, some of them complement each other. So then you have this fun dynamic of figuring out like what kind of team you want to stack up, focus on certain magic or certain physical aspects. Every individual character that you can catch, they're called mirages, like a little behemoth. Yeah. 
has his own skill tree that you can fill out and then eventually upgrade the behemoth from like a medium to a large, something like yeah. that, right? Yeah, and the stacking is just real silly. It's so silly. Yeah, yeah. It's and, so and fun. It's, it's dumb at first. Like, I was like, oh, these characters look stupid and I hate this. But then <laughs> after a while, the, yeah, after a while, the cuteness kind of gets to you in a positive way. Yeah. And then you get into it. So uh, I I definitely thank goodness for I'm, I think this is a Maxima edition, but I I I thank goodness for the fast forward button. Yeah, it's because I can fast forward through the bad dialogue. Mm-hmm. Like I, it's still the scene plays out just fast forwarded. So if I'm fast enough, I can read what they're saying and get the gist. But most of it is just long drawn out jokes and puns that weren't going anywhere anyways, right. or an explanation. Of an explanation that I already understood like two minutes ago. Like, yeah, I get the tutorial. You're going to throw up a tutorial page anyways after this dialogue. So what's the point of explaining it and over explaining it to me? So if you can get past the first couple of hours and actually get into the the game proper, like playing through the Cornelia section and listening to the original Final Fantasy music and having a good time with that, I think it's worthwhile, especially as a Final Fantasy fan. Now, if you're not familiar at all with Final Fantasy and you're not a Final Fantasy fan, the caveat is it may not be for you. Yeah, I think... The fan service is what carried me through up to this point. I think it's what keeps me interested, to be yeah. honest. And the fact so. that you can summon main characters from other games. Yeah. Maxima so automatically it. gives you Sephiroth Ooh. and Balthier. And the cool thing is, when you get a summon, because I, I naturally, through gameplay, got the World of Light Warrior. Warrior from, of Light. Yeah, Warrior of Light from the Final Fantasy One. When you get that character to be able to summon them, you also get their battle music. Mm-hmm. So and you can set to have battle music just play randomly among all the battle music you unlock. So like a Sephiroth theme or a song from Final Fantasy XII for Bothier, a remixed version of the battle music for Final Fantasy One. That's what I have so far. The more summons you get, the more battle music you have access to, and then you can set it to just that particular song or like I said, like a random assortment. And that's cool. It keeps battles fresh because different songs will play, and I kind of enjoy that. Yeah. So. Does it give you the uh, Sora summon? I haven't gotten one so far. Oh, okay. So I, I think don't, he was I, DLC. Oh, he was but DLC. I, I, I had him, so it might have oh, been cool. pre-order bonus or DLC, but yeah, that was, that was dope. Could be. I don't know how. If I see that they incorporate him in Maxima, I'll let you know. But so far, there hasn't been any hint of Kingdom Hearts other than the way it looks and acts. <laughs> right. <laughs> other than almost. Other than the entire about it. damn game, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it, and I'll probably continue to play that casually for funsies on the Switch and. I don't think it's on. I think the Square Enix sale actually ended, especially I, by the time this recording, but also especially by the time this comes out. Unfortunately, I wouldn't have been mad if I paid forty dollars for this, but I was glad to get it half off. And honestly, this, among many other games on the Switch, and I know on the other platforms, Square Enix has been putting them on fifty to sixty percent off on the regular. So if you yeah. wait long enough, you'll it'll come back around again for you. Ooh. All right. Well, I think we should get into gaming news yeah, now. Cool. We talked last week about doing our top five games of 2020 i'm really excited to get into that but let's let's kind of power through a, a couple of newsy bits before right. we get to that and then we'll, we'll we'll go to our our top games our bottom game all that good stuff all right so you heard this rumor too because we were chatting about this before recording but we got the list of free games for playstation plus for january we got the ps5 version of man eater we got Greedfall and shadow of the tomb raider Friend of the show, Deshaun Cardell Manning, he actually really gushed about this in an earlier episode of the podcast, how he was really recommending Greedfall. I went oh, out yeah. and bought it, but I haven't got around to playing it. But now you, you don't even have to buy it if you don't want to, because it's coming out for PlayStation Plus. So there's yeah. really no reason not to try the game. And Shadow of the Tomb Raider, I mean, don't need I say anything about it. But the interesting right. thing that is going around, it's a rumor that started on Reddit with a copy of an email that a customer got offering them a refund because they recently purchased the PS5 version of Maneater. And because it was coming out on PlayStation Plus, they were offering them a refund for it. Now, I've never heard of something like this. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely not Sony's usual prerogative. And it's honestly not on them to refund them. Yeah, because there's a couple of things about that. You don't technically own the game when you get it on PS Plus. All right. You have the license for it as long as you're a PS Plus member, and they actually allow you to still buy it. And Xbox Gold does this, too. They allow you to buy the game so you own it no matter what, but the fact that they would offer a refund for a game that they're not technically giving away, they just let you have access to it. 
it sounds a little fishy. So, no. friends, if you have PlayStation Plus, keep an eye on your email. And you recently purchased Man Eater on PS5. Keep an eye on your email. See if it actually offers a refund. Let us know. I'd be interested to hear if anybody else has actually experienced this. I have it on PS4, so I never really plan on buying it on PS5. But now I and know it's nice. I can just download it. That's cool. Right. But that's the rumor that's going around. And if it is true, it's actually kind of huge. Because... It makes being a little bit uh, iffy about buying older games because you feel like they're going to go on PS Plus soon or being upset because you just bought a game that went on PS Plus, like yeah. sting a little less. Right. So we'll, we'll follow that story as it develops. There's been an incredible prank being played on PS5 and Xbox Series X scalpers. Lately. Suck it, scalpers. Suck it, scalpers. You know what people have been doing? What they've been doing? They have been offering to purchase these overpriced consoles. And arranging for the scalper to drive hours and hours to a location to meet them and not showing up. That's amazing. Which, kudos. Like, I, I get that scalpers are out here trying to put food on the table. But we previously discussed, when you take something that's scarce and go and buy up as much as you can so no one else can get it when they just want to get their own. And then you plan to sell it for double, three times, five times the price, whatever it's going up to. Mm -hmm. You suck. Yeah, and, and here, you deserve to drive for two hours for nothing. Yeah, and here's the thing about that: you say they're trying to put food on the table, but you have enough money to buy eight PS fives, ten PS fives, fifteen PS fives. You already have money to put food on the table. You're just doing this extra stuff so you can have some extra money to play with. Yeah, you know because I mean? this isn't a sustainable business model. It's not like not it, this type of thing happens every single month. You're taking advantage of an opportunity to take advantage of people. Yeah, scalping and, uh, is is not a profession. <clears throat> Yeah, they're actually, uh, they look like they're kind of losing interest, or the prices are kind of going down a little bit on PS5s and Xbox Series Xs, well, good. because the holidays are over, there's mm -hmm. not that pressure to put it on the tree, mm -hmm. and it's good, I'm glad that some of these scalpers are going to be stuck with this shit, and they're just going to have to <laughs> sell them for what they bought them for, eventually, yeah. you know. Yeah, or but, possibly less. Yeah, I mean, I'm being patient, still. Mm. hoping that uh, once they start getting in stores, I'll actually find one and just grab one. And I've said this to you before, but honestly, you're not missing out. Yeah. It's neat to have that new piece of tech, and I understand the want for it, but it has not changed my life significantly. The only thing it has allowed me to do is play Cyberpunk before all the patches fix the game. Yeah. And now, you know well, I mean? now I have Miles Morales, because we finally traded what we uh, decided on trading. Yeah, and I don't have a PS5, so I'm just, just kind of looking at, at it. PS5 uh, launch edition of my Miles first Morales. PS5 game, and Yay. I can't play it. You can't play it though. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, you get to play it soon. It's pretty good. I think you're gonna enjoy it. It. it oh, I know. The best part is, is the longer you wait between playing the original Spider-Man and this, the more fresh it's gonna feel because it really is just an add-on. Like yeah. there's different stuff about it. It's definitely a more streamlined experience, but it does also feel like more Spider-Man. Yeah. So cool, 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 cool. Last bit of news. Actually, two more newsy bits I want to talk about. Crash Team Racing is offering a limited free game trial on the Switch until January 5th. So, And it started, at like I think, the 31st, I believe, or the 30th. So oh, okay. people listening may only have a day or two left to actually try it out. But it's worth it. I, I, a lot of people really oh, yeah, seem to really good game. Yeah, enjoy it. So if you haven't had a chance to try it out, you're on the fence. Now is your chance to play just a ton of it before it ends up having to be you know, behind a paywall again. So. Yeah, controversial statement. Uh, <laughs> Crash Team Racing better than Mario Kart. It is controversial. Yeah. What makes it better? I don't know, man. I honestly don't know. It just. Uh, I mean, is it, it the driving? It control, yeah, it, it control. Levels? It controls better to me. Uh huh. Um, the levels are well. Mario Kart levels are dope too. I don't know. I just I inch more towards Crash Team Racing probably because I had it on PS One when it came out, and it's kind of have that nostalgia for it. But I also mm -hmm had Mario Kart 64 over at my dad's house. So mm. I was able to play both of them. Just Crash Team Racing resonated more with me. So, And I love Crash. I love Crash. Yeah, yeah. It's not the first time I've heard that take. I've never played Crash Team Racing, so I might try it out so we can talk about it you know, oh, next sure. episode. Yeah. So I don't have any basis for comparison. Mario Kart's a pretty high bar, so that's, that's intriguing to me. Right. Google released their top searches for 2020. Ooh. And you may find this interesting. The search for PS5s, where to get a PS5 or PS5 in general, beat out searches for toilet paper this year. Wow. Now, considering the type of year we had, 
and the great toilet paper massacre of March and April. <laughs> <laughs> And the fact that toilet paper is way more universal than PS5s are, I find that to be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little tidbit for you. Apparently, to at least in America, I don't know if this was international or not, but I know at least I'm in sure America. I'm sure it wasn't. PS5, <laughs> people are wanting to wipe their butts with that more than toilet paper. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. Well, I think we should get into the much-anticipated top fives of 2020. So how do you want to do this? You want to go like five to one? I do one, you do one? Or yeah. You want like, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, All right, that. so let, let's go with yours first. So top five, what is number five? Number five. <laughs> <It's a completionist>. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, number five is Jedi Fallen Order. Wow. Jedi Fallen Order was a 2019 game. Yes, but I played it and, and beat it in 2020. I'll allow it, even though it's kind of against the rules. Okay. Wait, uh, wait. <laughs> I thought the rules were that we had to at least play the game for 30 hours. Like, games that we played and beat our top five. In yeah, but it had to come out in 2020. Oh, the, shit. The well, the worst like game this didn't, list. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, the worst game didn't have to come out in 2020, but the top five of 2020 needs to be from 2020. Okay. That's okay, though. Right. It's okay. Well, two two out of five of mine are not from 2020, but yeah. Uh, we'll let it slide. Don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but uh, yeah, Jedi. Yeah. Jedi Fallen Order, amazing Star Wars game. Who are the people that made that? Remedy? Same uh -huh. people that made uh, Titanfall 2, also an amazing game. Yes. Uh, Jedi Fallen Order is the most fun I've had with a Star Wars game since The Force Unleashed, mm. the first game on PS3. And this game just, even though it's got that Dark Souls, Demon Souls vibe to it, Mm -hmm. I found myself sticking with it and able to actually overcome it. Some parts I had to down the difficulty just a little bit, uh -huh. like on some second sister fights. But uh, other than that, man, it was great. The world was great. I love Star Wars Galaxy and everything that they put into this. Cal is a great character. Mm -hmm. uh, the crew of the ship was pretty dope. Uh, the worlds that you go to also great. The Wookiee planet, just everything. Everything about that Star Wars game was probably eight to... 10 out of 10 for me so i wholeheartedly agree yeah i think it's a great star wars game i also agree it's the best i've played since the force unleashed and i liked how you would fight unique monsters or have like side quests to fight tougher kind of like mini bosses I, the comparisons to dark souls you're not the first person to make them i didn't see it because to me the what sets dark souls apart is no matter how much you level up you're still getting your ass kicked if you make even a single mistake yeah. whereas in this game it's definitely tough in the beginning but progression does kind of open up combat for you and give you options. And as long as, I mean, obviously, if you make too many mistakes in a row, you'll still suffer. But as long right. as you're utilizing the toolkit that is expanding before you that you're pouring points into, you can come out on top fairly okay. Yeah. And, and again, like you said, save for some moments when you're fighting certain enemies, which is going to test you, which is good, I think, in a game. But I never felt like this game really hates me. And every time I play a Souls game, I'm like, this game really hates me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Awesome. All right. Number five. For me, Ghost of Tsushima. Ooh. Number all five. the way. All right. Number five, Ghost of Tsushima. I loved this game. I loved the art. I thought it was gorgeous. I loved the samurai gameplay versus stealth. It's one of the few games I've played that has action and stealth, and they balance really well, and they both feel super viable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Usually stealth, I always lean towards because it just fits my gameplay style more, but I enjoyed fighting in the open just as much as stealth, and I never felt like I failed or did an, a combat encounter suboptimally if I broke stealth in the middle of an engagement to, to do some physical attacking. It all just felt natural to me, right? Yeah, right, right. Combat, probably the best this year that I've played in a game as far as like the entire combat system itself, yeah. save for maybe one other example that's really kind of apples to oranges but definitely top two or three combat systems that i played it really makes that game what it is Good number game. four okay now number four since we came up with that rule i can't replace this one do with it a game that came out with 2020 okay so i'll let you know first it was xenoblade chronicles 2 okay. amazing game love it but uh -huh. and this this next one's also kind of cheating but okay. it's yakuza 4 remastered which came out earlier this year it counts. In a collection. Okay. It counts. Uh, it Yakuza, yeah. Yakuza 4 
is probably my second favorite Yakuza. Oh, mm, I don't know. There's so many. Mm. Uh, oh. Let's say let's say third favorite. Is that the one where you play as the loan shark? That yes. Got his money. Okay. Yes. That's one that that's the one I played through the most. I got I, I really love the part where you have to fight that guy that wears underwear on his head. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Yakuza 4, because Yakuza 3 left a bad taste in my mouth, because it just wasn't mm. that good. Okay. But, uh, Yakuza 4 pretty much did everything right, introduced new playable characters with interesting backstories that all kind of came together to create this awesome story, and the showdown at the end is mm. one of the most badass Japanese things I've ever seen in a game. Cool. And it's just, the dialogue is always there, the cutscenes are great, the combat is great. The character moments are awesome. I just, I can't gush enough about the Yakuza series as a whole. And I'm going to talk more about that later when I talk about my backlog stuff. But, uh, great. Yeah. Yakuza 4. All right. Number four for me, Marvel Spider Man Miles Morales, man. Ooh, baby. It is in the top five this year of games I've played that I enjoyed. The thing that I think is really great about Miles Morales is. It's in the same city as the original PS4 Spider-Man, but the city feels different. They really fleshed out Harlem since that's where Miles lives. And they kind of gave it a a winter makeover to make it feel like it's a different point in time for the city. Mm -hmm. But the landmarks and the way that the mission structure goes, I had Harlem and other parts of New York pretty much memorized. So I almost could navigate without having to look at the map by the end of the game, which was cool. cool. They did a really good job on all of Miles' different outfits. A lot of them look amazing. There is, you know, a little bit of side content. Some of the stuff that people complain about in the original game where you're not playing as Spider-Man, you're playing as, like, his roommate (laughs) or something like that. There's a little bit of just Miles in here, but it's not long enough to, like, overstay its welcome. There is some additional gameplay elements, like being able to go invisible or use his shock powers that they work into gameplay really well. Mm Mm-hmm. I could definitely have played a longer game, but the experience I got, I didn't feel like it was lacking or cut short. I felt like it was concise. If I had any critique of this game, it may be just kind of too much OC as far as like the bad guys. I would have preferred to see more stuff from the comic book, maybe. Oh, yeah. Uh, You know, some of the bad guys were generic, but a lot of his stuff, even with the bad guys, was very emotionally tied to him. And it made for great scenes. I love some of the post-game stuff about him interacting with his, his mother and his father. It's really good. So, and probably the breakout costume of the year and the thing I enjoyed the most and had the, the, had the most jovial time with, Bodega Cat costume. Yeah, Spider Cat. Just having Spider Cat pop out of your backpack and bat at the air and, and hearing, meow, while you're doing your combos. Meow. It's beautiful. Also, I, I can't quite explain it, but I've played both games this year. The remastered version of Spider-Man on PS4 and this. Mm -hmm. the web swinging and the trick system and the animations in miles morales are butter smooth Mm -hmm. you really do play with all the exaggerated swagger of a blade (laughs) (laughs) i I can't i I can't believe it's not butter i (laughs) i was trying to get through that without laughing (laughs) but no like you it they did i could tell that they made some tweaks to the system they'd already kind of developed in ps4 spider-man and I'm really excited to see what happens in the sequel because it feels somehow even better to play Spider-Man in Miles Morales than it did in the original Spider-Man. Like they up the game again. Oh, man. They're they're not substantial tweaks, but you do they're noticeable, and that's something because I thought the original animation and kind of movement and everything in the original Spider-Man was already top notch, and somehow they they put it a couple notches above. Right. Yeah. So man, that's them resources for you. Yeah, baby. Woo! Number three. Trails of Cold... I'm sorry. The Legend of Heroes, Trails of Cold <laughs> Steel 4. All one right. of the longest titles you'll ever hear from a game, but one of the most satisfying conclusions to a saga that I've ever played. So if you don't know, if you're not in the know, the mm. Legend of Heroes series started with Legend of Heroes, Trails in the Sky. That had three parts to it, and then there were two other games, Legend of Heroes, Trails of Zero, and Trails of Azure. And then the Trails of Cold Steel series, 1 through 4. So Trails of Cold Steel 4 is the culmination of nine games of story. Mm -hmm. And I've only played the Cold Steel ones, but they did a good enough job of letting me know the lore and the backstory without me feeling too left out for not having played the old games. Because the old games, some of them are only available in Japan or through fan translations and shit that I'm not trying to go through. 
mm. <laughs> in order to play. But Trails of Cold Steel for gameplay system really upped it from three. It's turn-based combat. The dialogue, there's a lot of dialogue. It's really good. Uh, the characters are really good. A lot of old characters come back. At a certain point, you have about 20 party members. But you can, I think there's about 30 to 35 that you can play with throughout the entire game. Mm. Which is crazy. It makes it seem, it seems like a lot, but the way that they kind of place them throughout the story, it's like, oh, cool. Now I get to play as this person. Oh, now I get to play as this person. Oh, mm. this person was against me a little while ago or two games ago, but now I'm playing as them here. It's really cool. It's really sweet. Very satisfying ending. It does that Tokyo Xanadu thing where I think most Falcom games do mm. where you kind of reload your clear data and then you get the true ending. That's or cool. Or you can fight the true last boss. So. Trails of Cold Steel 4, amazing series. If you have not played it, I've gushed about it enough on this podcast to let you know that if you are into JRPGs, it is something you should be on the lookout for. And actually, pretty hard to come by now that I think about it, because I haven't seen Trails of Cold Steel 1, 2, 3, or 4 out in any of my thrifting adventures. None. Mm. Yeah, definitely something I'm going to want to try. I know you loaned me one for a while, but it just I couldn't fit it in. Yeah. But uh, eventually I want to try it out. And the more I think about that mechanic you talk about where you finish the game and reload your save file, the more I like it. Because you think about a game like Persona, where there's always this true ending that you can miss if you make certain decisions. It's right. always kind of obvious what decisions you're supposed to make. But mm -hmm. you miss out on the bad ending if you don't want to have to like do some re reloading and whatnot, but the right. fact that they just kind of force you through to the vanilla ending and they'll go, but wait, there's more. And then you yeah. get to experience both as part of the normal gameplay loop. I, I dig that. Well, there That's is cool. extra, there's extra stuff that you have to do, but it's not too out of the way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it'll be like side missions or shit, which you're yeah. going to want to do anyway. So yeah. 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 Toast. Trails of Cold Steel. Go cool, cool. Number three. So for me, number three, 2020, Gotta be Persona 5 The Royal. Ooh, man. I gotta tell you something, man. I didn't get this when it dropped day one, because I was like, how much different can it possibly be from per so different? Right. So different. <laughs> the quality of life changed. Like, this is the special edition. We meant to release this, but we didn't have enough time. Here it is. And the extra story bits, the quality of life changes, the changes to combat, the way the characters interact, the extra. Just this is definitely if you've played the crap out of the original Persona 5 and you're on the fence. If you liked Persona 5 even a little bit, go for the Royal because it's like Persona 5 in every way, but just everything elevated to 11. It's amazing. Mm. I think we talked about this before. It's probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest JRPGs of all time. Yeah. Like Persona has had a long history of refining up to the opus that is Persona 5. And I, I got on board, I think, with 3. Didn't you, didn't you start with 4? I started with 4, yeah. Yeah. And 3 and 4 are definitely great in their own right, but 5 just took it to that next level. It oozes style. It oozes a feeling of just cool, you know? Yeah. It I I don't I don't have any other way to describe it. Everything is something that you never knew you needed, but now that you have it, you're like, why doesn't everybody else have it? Right. You know? It just slips in there like this is the way it always should have been. And everything else in your life loses color after it. Wow. That's why it's my number one. I mean, no, my number three. <laughs> See? <laughs> you never saw it coming. <laughs> you never saw it coming. No, so that's number three for me. Yeah, and I actually uh you can get it really cheap now. Yeah, surprisingly, I saw it at Disc Replay, which is a chain in the Midwest, for sixteen ninety nine, mm. and I was like, "That's incredible value." Yeah, yeah, it's, it is incredible value. It's a great game. Number two for me Ooh, is does number two work for. <laughs> <laughs> he works Sorry. for he works for the ghost, <laughs> the ghost of Tsushima is my yeah. number two game of twenty twenty. I gotta say, man. Uh, just to add on to what you said earlier, because you said you said enough, mm -hmm. but uh, the multiplayer really pushed this over the edge for me to get to yeah. number two. Because yeah. that was just I've only played it a few times, but that's some of the most fun I've had playing multiplayer in my life. We need to get back on and finish that, man. Oh yeah, we sure do. And then after that, we can get on Streets of Rage. But <laughs> I'm I'm okay with both of these things. Yes, yes, do them. But yeah, Ghost Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, we all knew that it was going to be amazing. 
mm-hmm. when we saw the trailers and stuff, but we didn't know how amazing it was going to be. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of just took my expectations and it said, take these back. Here's some more and add these to those. <laughs> it's just, it's so good. It's so good. The story's pretty good. The characters are, they're all right. Some of them are really good. Taka, I really like Taka. Mm-hmm. I really liked, uh, Yuna. Yeah. Uh, Jin himself, you, a bit of a wet blanket sometimes, but still a good protagonist. Yeah. And Uncle Daddy. Uncle is Daddy. Just the man you love to hate. You, you love <laughs> to hate that guy, but, uh, <laughs> Ghost of Tsushima number two, pulling out that samurai blade, throwing my ghost bombs and passing it off to you. Just the kunai just yeah. pierced my heart. Yes. <laughs> right on. And if you guys are interested, uh, just a little reminder, we did a spoiler cast on Ghost of Tsushima and a few custom haikus. It was a good time. You should definitely oh, yeah. check it out. <laughs> All right. Number two. For me, Hades. Bruh. Hades. Mm. Bruh. Hell. Hades is amazing. Hades is the single most greatest roguelike I have ever played. And there are there are a ton of awesome roguelikes out there. You know, Dead Cells, Binding of Isaac, Rogue Legacy. Uh, this what sets Hades apart is the fact that it takes that roguelike formula of dying and going back and restarting and 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 trying to get further and further in that run, learning the enemy patterns, learning the levels. You know, a little bit of light, you know, leveling, but not too heavy, just enough to to kind of help you kind of get further and further. And it incorporates it into the story since you are playing Zagreus, the son of Hades, and you're actually trying to escape Hades and you can't permanently die. So every time you're defeated by the denizens of Hades, you go back to start. Hades, your dad, teases you a bit like you're never going to get out of here. You're bitch made. And then you try again. <laughs> and... Ironically enough, he made you. <laughs> 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 That's your mother's side. Right. <laughs> And in your interactions with the different gods and the synergy of different powers you can get, like when you get duo boons, like from from both gods and the the challenges and interactions with the characters and the the development of your relationships with those characters. It's just I poured over 100 hours in this game. I would love to go back and pour more just for funsies, even though I've pretty much done everything in that game there is to do. And and the music, what can I say about the music? It's Daniel Korb, man. He he did the music for Bastion, Transistor. Supergiant yeah. is good for characters, story, and music. That is what they're known for, and for good reason. And Hades is the greatest thing that they have ever done yet, and I am mm-hmm. excited to see what they do next. If you haven't played it, you owe it to yourself to try that game out, because it is, if it wasn't for how cheap and nostalgic and emotionally manipulative my number one was hades would have been my number one yeah okay speaking of number one i think we probably should say the number one together what do you think yeah i was gonna say the same thing number Number one final Final fantasy Fantasy seven remake Woo! oh my god you knew it you knew it folks yeah once you once you said number two was Hades, I was like, well, we well, got the same number one. Of course we got the same number one. You already know what it is. Yeah. Honorable mention to The Last of Us Part Two. Game got way too much hate. It was an amazing game. Mm-hmm. Great gameplay. But Yeah, it, it was just, my number six, actually. I had I it, yeah. it got just beat out. But yeah, you're right. It's good. Yeah. But Final Fantasy VII Remake, what can we say that we have not already said? On our this, spoiler cast. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and spoiler alert, this is a uh, the, the undertaking that Tetsuya Nomura had with this game. Like, it's, it's almost incomprehensible because Final Fantasy VII fans are brats. You know what I mean? We're brats. Uh-huh. We yeah. know what we want and we wanted the same thing. We wanted the exact same thing until we realized that we didn't. And when he gave it to us, most of us loved it. Some of us are a little, all, you know, on the rails about it, but that switch up at the end there mm-hmm. was like amazing. No, I, I, it really gets me excited and anticipating what's going to happen next. And I think, you know, you can be of two minds about a remake. A remake can just be shot for shot the same thing, or it can be transformative, yeah. right? And for me, I'm team transformative, because if mm-hmm. you really like the original game, play the original game. The remake, 
takes the feeling from that original game and elevates it and then transforms it in a way that makes it its own thing while still retaining the spirit of the original. And that is, like you said, a hard line to hold that only a madman would attempt yeah. and only a genius can actually pull off. And I think that's what we have here. And he, yeah, really he's do. a bit of, Nomura is a, a bit of both of those things. <laughs> yeah, he is wearing a dress made out entirely out of belt buckles and he is a genius. <laughs> yeah. And I love him and hate him <laughs> yeah. because I think we talked about this before too. Auteurs, when you completely pull the reins off, sometimes you get a disaster. Kingdom Hearts 3, you know, rest in peace. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can see a bright future with it later on. I don't know. But as far as Final Fantasy 7 is concerned, there were enough hands of reverence in this and enough guidance, I think, from the original team members and the new team members. And I think this is his baby. It's one of his games that he loves the most. I mean, you you can it just oozes with reference and reverence and love. Like you mm -hmm. you can't elicit the kind of emotional response that we got out of playing this game unless you love this game. Right. You know what I mean? And everything about it from Advent Children, like all the uh, Crisis Core, mm -hmm. all the Core Crisis, everything. Like it's yep. all in there and referenced, and it's all done so well. And organic, and it fits together like a jigsaw. Just woof, one thousand pieces. Blah. Look at and it. it. It gives the characters more personality than they've ever had. Yes, it 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 perfectly encapsulates encapsul how I remember them, but not actually how they were. Because then you go right. back and play the game, and like, wow, these guys are kind of jerks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I remember this part. Yeah. So no, it's. Uh... It did such a good job capturing the spirit that it captured my spirit. And I don't think any other game could be number one this year other than that game. And you know what the best part is? And I've said this before. Final Fantasy VII isn't even my favorite Final Fantasy. If they did this for nine, I would die. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know if we're ever going to get it because I just don't think that game is yeah, as, popular as enough. revered. Yeah. yeah. It's, I don't it's, think... It's Sorry, just me and Hiro Hironobu Sakaguchi's favorite game. That's it. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think that you could remake any of these Final Fantasy games and have them be as good, as amazing, as thought provoking, as nostalgic as seven. I don't think I don't think you can. Maybe. I, I would really like to see an eight remake because I think eight had really good premises and characters but got a bad rap because of some of the gameplay mechanics. Yeah, I mean uh, I can go on and on about eight story, but the yeah. story when you really start to think about it starts to unravel and make almost zero sense. And it's just kinda one of the more out there Final Fantasy stories. Yeah. Even no, though it, I, start, it starts off really, like, grounded. <laughs> then it just ends Yeah, up. then you throw in amnesia and time travel, and you're like, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> amnesia, time travel, uh, space travel, woo. possession. Like, oh, they're man. all there. You're I, I, you're selling me on it now. Right. <laughs> space travel and possession? Death right. space me, please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, guys, Final Fantasy VII Remake. That's number our top one number one in 2020. If you haven't played it, get out there and play it right now. I might play it again this year. It, I went back and started playing the original Final Fantasy VII just so I can get that vibe again after I finished the game. Mm -hmm. We talked about this before. When you experience a piece of media that transcends you to an emotional state that you can't really immediately come down from mm -hmm. and no other game measures up, there is a period of weeks after Final Fantasy VII, after I finished it for the first time, where I was just like, nothing else can compare. Yeah, and also, like, there's not many games where you beat the game and you're immediately calling all your friends, messaging all your friends, like, dude, did you beat it yet? Did you beat it yet? Bro, we, we need to talk, talk about, about it. This. Yeah, yeah, Like, exactly. And then you're going on YouTube and you're looking up everybody who's beaten it and you're watching all of the reviews and just, oh, yeah, God, so good. I love yeah, it. Yeah, it was definitely, the last hours of that game was definitely the water cooler moment for RPG fans in 2020, for sure, for yeah. sure. All right. Well, I would like to give an honorable mention as well. Okay. I want to give an honorable mention to a game that I played and beat this year, but that came out in 2019, A Short Hike. I'm okay. going to give it my Indie Darling Award. A Short mm -hmm. Hike is a short game, but is no less good for it. It is a tight, concise, fun, cute experience. It put me in a very good mood. It actually has a surprisingly heartfelt ending. And I really enjoyed kind of navigating through it and meeting all the different characters in it and doing all the little organic side quests that come up as you explore this little island as a bird who is on her summer vacation. It's pretty cheap. I recommend going and checking it out if you like indie games or kind of more chill experiences. I think it's definitely worth it. So yeah, I think at this point we should go on to our worst game. Now, I cheated a little bit. I said we should do one game. I look... 
it's funny. I didn't think I played that many bad games this year. But then when I look back, I was like, there there was three in particular I wanted to mention. So I gave them all their own awards. There's two games I think I'm going to say are the worst games and one I'm giving a dishonorable mention. Okay. So, but let's go with yours. What'd you, what'd you have? Uh, the worst game that I played in 2020 was Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, The Black Order. Oh, no. <laughs> Man, when I say that I have been waiting on a sequel to Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 for so long, mm-hmm. and this game came, and I was so excited when I saw the first trailer, and then it just let me down so hard. What about it did you not like? Let's go over it together. I don't like that it does that thing that ever since the MCU has become a real popular thing that all other forms of Marvel media do. It uses the movies, the MCU movies and the characters and everything. And it doesn't venture really outside of the movies to the comics for the plot, for the main plot. So like this game uses the Black Order and Thanos and the Infinity Stones. And we've seen it in everything. We've seen it in the Avengers shows and the movies and now the game and it's just like i'm getting tired of it yeah but they've kind of uh i mean just to push back on that a little bit i, yeah. I get where you're coming from i completely do they kind of always done that i mean if you look at x-men legends 2 they ripped jokes directly from the original x-men movie like the whole wolverine flipping people off of his middle claw and mm-hmm. when apocalypse was really big they were doing an apocalypse storyline and with Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2, the whole Civil War thing, like they just pick popular stories that are either in print at the time or popular in parallel media. And they elevate that because that's the story on the public conscious at the time. You've seen like the main characters that get featured shift, like you said, depending on the influence of right. whatever is popular at the time, whether that be Spider-Man or the X-Men movies originally, now the Avengers. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that that helps because there are new fans developing for that those types of stories and those types of characters while i had some grievances of marvel ultimate alliance 3 myself i i wasn't so much worried about the story they picked as long as the execution was okay would you say the execution was bad on that yeah i mean it was it, it was pretty pretty bland pretty cookie cutter and when i say uh that they use the stuff from the movies too much like the movies the mcu is front and center it's everywhere now when you when you were talking about you know using the civil war storyline and the apocalypse and the comics like at that point at those points in time i wasn't playing or reading comics so these were new things for me and they weren't like Mm. thrust in my face like in the movies and everything so when i'm playing the uh black order i'm just like okay i get it thanos the black order the stones we got to get the stones oh somebody gets the stone and does something with it and then we got to get it back and then it just uh it just gets tiring. I'm tired of the stones. I really am. That's fair. I was actually more, as far as disappointment in Marvel Ultimate Alliance, I was more disappointed in Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. Mm-hmm. I feel like X-Men Legends 1 was a valiant effort, but they they were missing a lot of things. They were missing expansive trees. They were missing a new game plus. X-Men Legends 2 added all that in. And I thought the powers perfect. for the characters. Yeah, it was perfect. Yeah, The powers for the characters are really cool and creative. Especially for Magneto and Juggernaut. I love them in that. Back when CG cutscenes were like just everything. Yeah. That uh, angel turning into Archangel scene was just... I'm going to go watch that when we're done. (laughs) Yeah. No, it was really cool. Definitely. And then Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1, there was a lot of great things about that. There were divergent skill trees. You went to very much varied worlds. I will agree with you that the story was a little more unique. And they really played a lot with like a lot of the B content from the games to bring out some interesting environments. I like the arcade mode where you competed for points. I like the combo system that they had that they kind of refined from the original X-Men Legends games. Mm -hmm. And they took all of that away in Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. You really only had like one kind of skill set or power set to go through when you could kind of alter it a little bit, but not near as much customization as... One and they they removed even more, admittedly, in three. Like, there's no combo system, no grabs, and zero customization. You just have the powers you have. And I think that streamline of gameplay makes it feel more, and it's appropriate. I think that the Warriors developers, Omega Force is one that developed this game. It feels more like a Warriors game rather than an RPG. And I think the stripping away or dumbing down of its RPG roots is what really sealed it for me as far as negative things about that game. I still really enjoyed the game. Obviously, since I played it a ton this year and last year, but I get your grievance. I just think 
the story has never been like super great in these games. What really attracted me was the gameplay. And that's the thing that's been stripped away more and more for me. Yeah. Uh, the gameplay in this game, not amazing. Yeah. Uh, honestly, to me, the first game was my favorite as far as gameplay. Which first is, Marvel which, Ultimate Alliance? Yeah, which is crazy. Okay. But, um, that's great. All, it's the, a good all game. this, yeah, all this to say that Ultimate Alliance 3 is not a bad game. Uh-uh. It's just the worst game that I played this year. <laughs> you know what? That's actually not bad. If you bought them out of Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, then I think you're doing okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad game. Don't email us saying, I can't believe you didn't like this. No, definitely uh, add Derek for that. Sure. Yeah. Get <laughs> but, it. yeah, it's not a bad game. It's just the worst one I play. And I play bangers, man. Bangers yeah. all year. <laughs> it was a great so. year for games. I mean, I hadn't mentioned it before, but we talked briefly about Last of Us. I finished and played some great games this year. Last of Us Part 2, Resident Evil 3, Food Truck Tycoon Asia Cuisine. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, all jokes aside, like, there there's some, some great games that I played this year that, you know, I would have loved to include in the top five, but it was a hard list to make. Now, as far as my worst games, I got two that I want to talk about that I think deserve spotlight here. One, I would call the most boring game that I played this year. Tembo the Badass Elephant. I think I've it, heard of that, yeah. It's made by Game Freak, the same people that make Pokemon, so you'd think mm-hmm. that would be pretty decent. Right. But And you play as an elephant. It's kind of like, not like an endless runner, like you're not exactly on rails, but there's definitely like, you run through the level as fast as you can. You have jumps and slides and dodges and, and breakthroughs and stuff, attacks. And you're trying to like save all the people and get through the war zone with your, you know, your war elephant. Mm-hmm. And it the I don't know if it's just the level design or how slow or tanky that the elephant moves, which kind of makes sense. But juxtapose against the gameplay, wanting you to move through gracefully and fast, it doesn't click for me. And I remember I played it for a Blind Play Wednesday this year. I only a lot an hour for that show, and I couldn't even finish the hour. Oh, wow. In the middle of the stream, I got—I was like, guys, I am so bored. I'm just going to switch out to a different game. Wow. And I've never done that in a stream before where I was like, this game sucks so bad. I need to play something different or I'm going to just cut the stream. So <laughs> no shade against people who worked really hard on that game. It's just not for me. And again, it, it just had to do with the way that the character controlled and the pacing and the level design. I just, it lulled me to sleep, to be honest. Yeah. And then... There's another bad game I played this year that on its just mechanic side is actually kind of interesting and one of the reasons why I bought it, but just the execution of it made it bad. I will give it the most racist award <laughs> for the game I played this year. It's game. It's an indie game called Beat Cop. That's racist! <laughs> <laughs> and you play as a cop who was demoted from detective after you killed an innocent... Like, you literally broke Whoa. into a, a home or uh, I guess a, like a robber who was black broke in and you shot them or whatever. Why is this like, a game? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it starts off with like you just murdering a, a perp who happens to be a perp of color. And they, they frame it in such a way as like, it was bad that this happened to you. But I'm like, no, you probably shouldn't have done that. You get to right. mark down a beat cop. And I think it's in the 80s and everybody is just racist. And most of the criminals act in a very stereotypical way <laughs> and i don't want to go on and on but i was just playing it and there's this disclaimer in the beginning like this is just a game don't take things so seriously and i'm like what is there to take seriously and then i started right. playing it and i was just like oh god oh, no. it intrigued me to be like to have a neighborhood that i would work as a cop in writing tickets catching muggers that type of thing whatever whatever but the just the dialogue and the way things played out like it was racist against like Italians and Asians and black people. Like they just went in. Wow. I was just like, who fucking wrote this game? <laughs> so you'll see it on sale all the time on like Switch and probably other platforms. Don't waste your money. Mm. It's not that interesting gameplay wise to endure support monetarily the kind of racist bullshit vitriol that's is spouted in that game. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's all I gotta say about that. Be cop. <laughs> now Dishonorable mention goes to a game that was bad, but doesn't really stand out for any particular reason. It was just meh for me. And that is Travis Strikes Again, No More oh, Heroes. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to like it because, again, I like the style. But again, I played, you know, No More Heroes HD. And then after I finished it, I was like, no, this game isn't actually that great. <laughs> so <laughs> for all its intrigue and interest in the cult following that the Normal Heroes franchise has, even its fans particularly don't like Travis Strikes Again. Wow. And for good reason. It's just, 
monotonous and uninspired. And it, to me, it just feels like a missed opportunity, especially given its premise. So All right. that, uh, that, that covers the bad games that I played this year, or the worst, yeah. I should say. All right. Well, I guess we should move on to our backlog, what we hope to get beaten in our backlog of video games this new year. My backlog games are Yakuza 5 and 6. Mm-hmm. I've been wanting to play through the series. I've been playing through the series for the past couple of years. And like I said before, I love it. I know these next two games are supposed to be really good, some of the best in the series. Mm-hmm. But the real reason that I want to get through them so fast is because I really, really want to play Yakuza Like a Dragon. Yeah, me too, actually. Because they changed up the gameplay to a turn-based RPG, and it's just crazy. It's like I saw a a scene of Goro Majima doing a special move, I guess. He's running down a building, and then he starts throwing a couple of knives, and then he turns around, and like a thousand knives fly out. And that's like his special move. And it's just... I saw that. It looked pretty yeah, nice. Yeah, and it's just like taking the already over-the-top Yakuza style and just elevating it with, with that. RPG tropes. Yeah, yeah exactly. I love it. With that super Japanese flair that we all love here at Player 2 as another podcast. And... <laughs> The other game on my backlog is East Memories of Cell Seta. Mm. Y'all know, y'all listen to us, we love East. And East 9 is right around the corner. February mm. 21st, I think. Wow. Yeah, oh, you're it's, right. it's, it's, it's really close. Version. It's coming yeah. out in February. So mm. I would like to get that game beaten before 9 comes out, mm. but I don't know if I will because, uh, I, I'm just scared that if I play 9, I'm not gonna wanna go back. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. But, I mean, these games are all good in their own right, so I may not have that problem. I might. We'll just have to wait and see. I will let you know. You know, I <laughs> I hate to say it, because I know I told you I was like I wasn't really sure what my backlog would be before we started recording, but your backlog is my backlog. Yeah? I Well, not exactly, exactly. I want to play, I don't need to play the other Yakuza's. I want to play Like a Dragon. Yeah. It's a game in 2020 that came out that's gotten a lot of buzz. A lot of people really love it. I mean, it's like their favorite Yakuza game. And I did. I really didn't expect it because I thought it was such a switch up from the original formula with the brawler style yeah. that it would be divisive. But it just seems like unanimously people love this game. And I heard it's one of the few Yakuza games, if not the only Yakuza game, that they actually did uh, English voice acting for. Is that true? Uh, Yeah, I think so, man. Yeah, yeah. So and that was one of my barriers to entry. We talked about it before. It, it gets a little exhausting. When you're playing a video game, which you do for a lot longer than, say, like watching a show. And again, with animated, I prefer the dubs than subs, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So whereas I watch Sweet Home with the subs because it's live action, I like the Yakuza with the dubs, but I you know, have, no, have no dubs. Right. <laughs> so if that's true, if I heard that right, I extra want to check it out. And like you, I picked up Memories of Celseta, and I would like to play that before 9. I have a little bit more time, because my 9 is the Switch version, which ain't coming out until the summer. Oh. So, and I don't mind waiting, because I got Persona 5 Strikers to hold me down, oh, which yeah. launches oh me God. into my most anticipated games of 2021. Oh, pew, 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 pew. 2021, anticipated games. I'm Aziz Ansari. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, you should! <laughs> <laughs> so, just to rattle them off, these are the games coming out this year that I'm most excited about and I really want to play. First, Dungeons and Dragons Dark Alliance. It's actually following the Legend of Drist heroes, like that whole kind of series of books, and I've read them and I love those books. They're some of my favorite books. Drist Durden is one of my favorite literary characters of all time. Mm-hmm. So I'm super excited to play that. Nerd. Plus, a big fan of... Big fan of Dark Alliance, like back in uh, the PS2 days. I didn't have a PC, but I played the, the Baldur's Gate games on okay. you know, PS2. And uh, total nerd. But that <laughs> those games, like, I just, I met Drizzt Dorden through those games. And then I was rapping with somebody at my old machinist job. We were talking books. And I liked already to read kind of fantasy novels anyways. I was reading this series called The Belgariad by David Eddings, which is actually a really good series. It's a little Lord of the Rings-esque, but easier to digest. And he recommended the Dark Elf Trilogy, which is kind of like a prequel of books that outlines Drist's uh, origins. And if you don't know who Drist Dorden is in the Dungeons and Dragons mythology, he's a dark elf. And dark elves live in the underground in kind of like a subterranean area. So they all have like red eyes because they, they view infrared. 
and they're they're mainly a bad race like they attack other people they worship the spider god lolf i think her name is and she's just very vicious and Drist is born in a matriarchal society as a young male dark elf with violet eyes Uh oh and he ends up kind of like immediately seeing the evils and the atrocities wrought by his people and kind of being against it but also because of the color of his skin, he's often feared and attacked by people on the surface world, too. So he, ha- he has like an identity crisis, and it touches on a lot of stuff. It touches on stereotypes. It touches on racism. It touches on being an outcast. It touches on cultural expectations. It gets surprisingly deep for a book written about a fantasy character in the 80s. Okay. And it really touched me on like a deep emotional level. So for people who are interested, check that out. Didn't mean to go that much into Dark Alliance, <laughs> but uh, let's just rattle off the other ones. God of War Ragnarok. Yeah. Pew, 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 pew. Breath of the Wild 2. You know okay. it. Right. Pokemon Snap. All right. Coming out this year, I believe. Persona 5 Strikers, I just mentioned. Ratchet and Clank, Rift Apart, mm-hmm. Resident Evil Village. And These I, are the games, Mikey Likey. Yeah, let me say this one thing about uh, God of War is my most anticipated game. Because yeah. in the mainline series, each God of War is like multiple times better than the last game in the series. Like mm-hmm. two was so much better than one. Three was like astronomically better than two. And they're mm-hmm. all amazing games in their own right. And four just took that that formula, reshaped it, remolded the character, and just made it something new, fresh, and amazing. So I know that Ragnarok is gonna be So we ain't gonna talk about Ascension. We're just we're just gonna skip Ascension. I said I said mainline. Okay. Mainline. All right. Numbered okay. entries. Okay. Ascension was me. <laughs> okay. Well, let's come Ascension. Yeah, Ascension. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. They got to Ragnarok. Go, Ghost of Sparta. We ain't going to talk about the PSPs? Nah. Nope. No, no Chains of Olympus, no Ghost of Sparta. Okay. No Ascension multiplayer. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. God of War was such a surprise hit with me because I was kind of over the character and how he was portrayed in the original PS2 days. And they really did a decent redemption with that franchise and that character in a, in a way I didn't expect Corey Barlog could pull off, to be yeah. honest. Mm-hmm. So kudos to him and the entire team. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, we're... A, we're, we're there bro. Bro. <laughs> yeah we're approaching an hour and a half before editing so i'm we've done this once before do you think we should put off the Derek x mike anime challenge for this week uh yeah i think we can do that okay all right guys we're gonna follow up with episodes 40 through 42 of full metal alchemist brotherhood and episode 14 of berserk i heard you say earlier that was really good i'm so excited to hear you talk about it yeah. well we're gonna put that off we, we try to get just under just over an hour before we do that i don't want to make the show crazy huge so we'll talk about that next week but that's cool just build up some anticipation you know maybe, maybe give you some more right. time to catch up with yeah. us watch these shows with us yeah and let me just uh before we uh sign off let me give you what i'm feeling this week i don't know if you're feeling anything but i'm feeling peacock premium that's NBC streaming service. And the reason I'm feeling it is because The Office is no longer on Netflix. But I get... <laughs> right. But I get Peacock Premium. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't boo you. Boo. How do you like boo. me? Boo. <laughs> I, don't like t- I don't like it very much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, Peacock Premium has The Office, and it also has extended extra episodes. Well, not extra episodes, but well, they, they do they like ex- the uh, yeah, yeah, the extended episodes, the outtakes from like the... season three. Like they have like an episode that I watched that was like thirty six minutes. That was originally like only a half hour or something like that. So there's a lot of extra stuff. Uh, I just watched the episode where Michael is gonna jump off the roof, and there was just a bunch of <laughs> there's the extra scenes in there where everybody's trying to say different stuff to get him down mm. <laughs> because he's trying to prove that working in the office is more dangerous than working in the warehouse this is mm. just hilarious yeah but, i remember uh, that episode yeah it's, yeah it's, i'm only it's, saying boo because not everybody has access to peacock and it sucks that like they took it off of netflix but i get you yeah like <laughs> yeah that, that's what i'm feeling this week because i'm able to feel it baby yeah well i do have a link to direct tv it's how i get my hbo max so we might we might need to go ahead and download peacock premium so we can have that but for those out there who don't have access to peacock what do you think the go-to show should be for when you put on Netflix and you don't know what to watch, so you just put on The Office? I think it'd be Shit's Creek. Yeah? Yeah. It's a much shorter show, but it's got a very good comedy off the route. And it's just one of those things you can just throw in the background. And I think, much like The Office, once you watch it enough, you'll start 
knowing exactly what character is going to say what when, and then that adds to the experience. So yeah, yeah, I think Kristen would agree with you. I think she's already shot through that show like four or five times. Oh wow, <laughs> she no, she loves it. Oh my gosh, she oh took to God. it immediately. A lot saw saw. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit, my favorite character in the show is the mom for yeah. sure. Yeah, the mom yeah, from Home Alone. Great. She's great. Mm-hmm. Kevin. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, for me, the show that I, if I'm on Netflix and I'm like, I don't know what to watch, I'm just going to throw on Queer Eye now. I think that that's the show I'd like to have on the background. Okay, okay. Every time I see the episode description and think back on the episode, I'm like, oh, that one was okay. And then I watch it. I'm like, no, it was way better than okay. Right. Uh, <laughs> My such tears. I love those guys. Speaking of which, Jonathan Van Ness, and those who don't know, he's the guy that does the grooming and the hair on Queer Eye. On Netflix, he just got married. Oh, really? Cool. Congratulations, Jonathan Van Ness. Yeah. He was kind of a faux celebrity crush for me. Like, I'm not gay, but I still wanted to claim him because he's so great. <laughs> and I'm a little jealous he got married. Oh, that's Because okay. I heard he's into bears. He could still be yours. He could still be mine. Yeah. <laughs> and deep down in my heart. So, right. but in all seriousness, congratulations, Jonathan Van Ness. I'm very happy for you. What I'm feeling this week, I would have to say... And I, I know this hopefully will fit in with a lot of people's New Year's resolutions. I'm feeling my pull-up bar that my wife got me for, I think, my birthday or Christmas a few years ago. Oh, okay. I have a, like, it's like a $30, $35. I think you usually get me anywhere from between 20 and 40 bucks. But it's a type of pull-up bar that you can assemble and place on a door frame. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really great to get a pull-up bar, especially in a high-traffic door frame, because then you can just do one or two as you go to and fro. It's obviously tough at first, especially if you don't do a whole lot of pull-ups, but a technique that I learned that really helps me out when I get out of practice or just want to get a few more reps in, reverse pull-ups. You, you've done those before, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So for those who don't know, reverse pull-up is when you kind of jump up and get to the top of a pull-up and then you slowly release back down. You're still working the muscles in a way. So if you can't work yourself into doing a full pull-up when you first start, reverse pull-ups will get those muscles working. In a way that after you do enough of them, eventually you start to kind of be able to do dead hang pull ups on your own. So I highly recommend it. It's a cheap way to get a little bit of exercise in. It's always there. It's fun just to jump up and get a few in. You're working your arms. You're working your shoulders. You're working your back. You can do pull ups and chin ups. Most of them have like different positions. So you can try like pull ups where your arms are close together or far apart. You can do, you know, like pull ups from the sides and all of that works different muscle groups. So me, I'm feeling fitness, even though I fail at it this year, and <laughs> and I'm trying to get back on. I'm on the treadmill playing Final Fantasy X. I need to start watching my calories again. That's a big thing. It's just, man, being in this house, it's been such a blessing and a curse, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm feeling a pull-up bar. I hope you guys will, too. Definitely check it out. If you have a chance, if you're stealing somebody's cable. Get in on Peacock <laughs> Premium so you can see the cold open where Jim convinces Dwight that he's in the Matrix. Yeah. It's good times. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't watched so, it yet, but I will see. Yeah, it's, it's a good extra extra scene. I actually really like that one. It stands out. So, so before we head out, just so people know where to find you, the games that you sell, the toys that you sell, the goodies and more, where can they locate you at, Derek? They can check out the eBay store at ebay.com slash str slash gamer goodies and more. Follow me on Instagram at gamer goodies more and on Twitter at goodies underscore more. I'm trying to get back into the habit of posting stuff on my social media because I kind of fell off uh, there at the end of the year, but I'm pushing forward. I'm doing it. You guys are going to see the stuff. And you're going to like it. Okay. As far as the podcast goes, we have that Facebook page. Come, you know, visit and give us a like, maybe follow us. We're on facebook.com slash player two has entered the pod. We also have a YouTube channel called Player 2 has Entered the Podcast. Subscribe to us there if you want to get links to our episodes to listen on YouTube. And also a lot of the clips that we're putting on our Facebook page. It helps us out. We really appreciate it. You can find new episodes of our podcast uploaded every single Sunday at our hub, anchor.fm slash player 2 has entered the pod. And we're also available to listen to on pretty much wherever you can find podcasts. Breaker, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. If you want to email us any questions, feedback, comments, suggestions, criticisms for our show, you can send them to mcpaperstacks at gmail.com. We really appreciate your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Maybe even have a few guests on if you're so inclined. And for me personally, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at Mike Peterson AL. 
and my YouTube channel for Twitch stream archives, MC Paper Stacks Plays. And I'm on Twitch, twitch.tv slash MC Paper Stacks. Mondays, I'm playing Warriors and Brawlers games. Right now, it's the story mode of Age of Calamity. That's at 9 p.m. Eastern. Fridays, horror games at 10 p.m. Eastern. The mainstream, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Kind of slogging through cyberpunk right now. <laughs> uh, you know, the story parts are actually pretty good. It's just, yes to the game. So mm. <laughs> what are you going to do? But yeah, that is our show. We appreciate you listening to us every week and supporting us, sharing us around with people you think that will dig our show. We try to grow and everything that you do in service to that. We greatly appreciate the, the effort is noticed. So we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Peace.